Welcome back, everyone, to the podcast. Uh, super, 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 super duper excited to uh, have a conversation and introduce you to my uh, longtime friend, an amazing artist, writer, uh, art instructor extraordinaire, uh, Noah Woods. Today, we're going to be talking about, uh, well, we're going to be talking a lot of, about a lot of things, but what one thing that's cool about being in connection with other artists, especially as long as Noah and I have been, is that you can kind of uh, support each other, you can inspire each other, you can validate uh, the hunches one has about what's possible for them. If someone's standing off to your side who supports you and helps you imagine what's possible for yourself, because at the end of the day, this whole art making thing is about change and that's scary. Uh, but to do this process, to be this artist, to be on the creative path with a friend um, and those who support you uh, makes so, so much possible. So that's a sort of like the idea here about following your hunches and trusting that. Um, and we're just gonna be sharing some stories and some amazing, uh, amazing things that have happened to both of us over the last uh, 20 or 30, 40 years now, I don't know, about 30 years actually. Um, no, uh, closer, closer to 40. Okay. 40 years. Anyway, uh, Noah, how are you, how are you doing today? And thanks so much for coming on. Nick, it is such a treat to be with you. Seriously. I, I, uh, I'm so looking forward to our talk today and just spending time with you as always. Um, this is a, such a treat. How yeah, it's long, good. It's, it's long overdue and, you know, when people say, oh, my God, I got the coolest job. This is one of those days <laughs> I get to this is my job and I get to talk to you. And uh, and so it's just it's just so easy. And there's no it's you know, sometimes when I interview people, I don't I don't know them a lot of times. And I have to really put a lot of effort into trying to figure out where they're going and where they're coming from. And I'm never really sure until I'm in the interview. And it's it's kind of like low grade stress. But. I just know you so thoroughly, and uh, it's, so this is to me is just the best. <laughs> you know too, you know too much. Yeah, I know too much, and I know too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not even but I'm interviewing you, so you don't get to tell anything about me. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> um, so why don't you fill? Why don't you fill folks in uh, about where you are and and what you're involved in, and uh, maybe a little bit about. Yeah, you know, I don't know how we met, and I can jump in as well. Okay, the the, the version that I remember of how we met, uh, Nick and I, you and I, we we were going to the same art school, Art Center College of Design, and um, I had actually heard about you, Nick. I hadn't met you yet, but um, I had heard about you. You were already making waves as a student. Uh, and, yeah, right. <laughs> It was at the Hillside campus and um, the the classes were five hours long. So there were breaks. And I remember taking a break, walking outside the, the room. It was room 111 um, on My the bottom. God. And you had your work. As soon as I walked out the door, there you were. And you had your work spread out all over the the, the hallway floor and people were crowded around and you're you were explaining how you did it and people had questions and everyone was like oh my goodness this is you know this is so good and and I and then I introduced myself and that's how we first met but we really we we weren't we really started we became friends when we unbeknownst to each other we had moved to New York at, at roughly the same time and a fellow classmate of ours who's had crazy success, um, a guy named Doug Lloyd. Doug was the art director of a lot of things, Mademoiselle Magazine. He was um, art director of Barney's New York. And um, and, and I think um, also he was the creative director for Gucci and Tom Ford. Um, Doug had thrown a party downtown in New York and he invited the two of us separately and then I remember you were sitting at a sitting at a table, and I'm like, "What are you doing here?" And you're like, "What are you doing here?" And 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 I said, "Where are we?" And you're and you were like, "This is Soho," and I'm like, 
was like, Soho is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was the eighties. It was, it was the height of um, one of the greatest um, exciting times in, in fine art. Um, Soho, I do believe was the highest density of art galleries in yeah. the world at the time. I think there were over 160 galleries just outside our doors in Soho. And, um, you could literally every day you could go to a new, a new gallery. But anyway, you told me where we were. I was living uptown on 28th street for like a couple of months in a, in a mouse infest, rat infested place. And I heard about an illegal sublet and it was, and it turned out to be a block down from you. And, um, but that I, I was just so in love with being in Soho. I just jumped at getting that place in Soho and the place was so tiny. The place that I was renting, it was so small. You had to stand while sleeping. That's how small it was. Um, and I, you know, it was magic. And then, what happened with us is that when we found out that we were just like a block, a block and a half apart, we were really at the start of our career. And um, I don't know about you, but I was doing like four or five interviews every morning up at magazines, newspapers, ad agencies, design design houses. Yeah, we, we were doing just just to let you guys know, we were we both moved to New York City. Uh, we both started in editorial illustration. So I was not, I was doing paintings on the side a little bit, but I was more just surviving by doing things for magazines and book covers. So. Exactly. And, um, but, but the wonderful thing that happened was um, your cooking skills became fantastic. And every, I think I'm, like so many times a week, I would walk a block over to your place you'd make a pasta dinner of some kind and we would talk about all the people that we met with that day. So we would do our meetings in the morning and then, um, go, we would go uptown to, you know, fifth Avenue, 57th street where Madison Avenue, where all the magazines, newspapers and design houses were, and we would show our books. And, um, I think we both kind of got work right away and we were, you know, uh, the gods were looking down on us and, I mean, I look back, I don't know about you, but I look back on it like it was war and peace. It was the best of times. It was the worst of yeah. times. And it was, yeah, pure, it was pure magic. I remember you got mugged <laughs> and, <laughs> ever, and, you know, cause it was, that was, for us. <laughs> I, that was like, that wasn't a bad, I mean, I don't look at that as like, oh my God, you and I were having dinner with two other friends and I was very dumbly walked back to my place. What was I thinking? I was living on 28th street, um, in the, in the, in the clothing district, which completely shuts down at night. And I walked, I turned on seventh Avenue to my street on 28th, completely pitch black street and really set myself up. I was living in a, in a, in a flat that was above an old fashioned diner and you had to pull up the the grates to uh, oh, yeah. all that stuff. Didn't get in. Didn't get inside quick enough. <laughs> so anyway, it was w w one cool thing was just having each other to talk about where we were trying to go with our work and what you know what felt trying different things on, figuring out what felt more personal. And I know, uh, <clears throat> I know. For me, I was, you know, it wasn't easy trying to just make art for all these different publications. And there was a lot of talk around, you know, how you wanted to express it, what's the style of what you were doing and your point of view really to develop your point of view. That was uh, at the, you know, and this still relates. I mean, I'm still teaching people this, like, what's your point of view? Where do you want to go with this? And I remember talking about for, for myself, wanting to go into fine art, not having the confidence to do that, um, you know, and always being supported by you, uh, wishing in many ways that I had just had more confidence to follow that. Um, do, do you know what I mean? Like we had that, we had that rapport and we had that support and. We definitely had that support. We definitely ha have always had that rapport between us. 
But Nick, I've always seen you as extremely confident, not that you didn't have, haven't had challenges along the way creatively. Uh, so that, that, that I don't see about you. Um, just FYI, what, you even back then had an entrepreneurial way about you. You were figuring out things of like how to approach um, this this illustration career that we were both uh, on that pathway of, and I feel like I was like listening to your moves, like who you know, like 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 as far as promotion and getting our name out and mm-hmm. things like that. That was coming from you. That wasn't my idea of as far as far as how to do it. Now everyone knows how to do it. I had some suspicions of how to do it, and I was trying a few things, but you were doing it on a a little grander of a scale. And I was like, let me just follow right in step with you. <laughs> you know, there was that. I remember the, the, the back in those days, you would show your work to these publications by literally, there was no real website. It was, it was just dropping a portfolio off at these magazines. And, and then on Mondays, they would look at it. The New York times would look at portfolios and you go there and there's like 30 or 40 black portfolio cases in the hallway and they all looked the same. And that got me going to make boxes and make your thing look different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I act so like I was actually doing, I pretty sure about four to five interviews every day. And I had, I came to New York with two portfolios, one to drop off and one for uh, about uh, the four other ones to do one-on-one. I did not know that I was going to get a whole other education by going on hundreds and hundreds of interviews uh, and over those two years that I was there. Because every every time that I was talking with an art director, I I would get something else. They would tell me what they wanted. It was a lot of different things, but um, it also taught me about just conversation. I got that growing up in the house that I grew up in because there was conversation at the dinner table, but, and, you know, you had to talk uh, at the dinner table in order to survive in my family because there was a, there were a lot of uh, big voices. Um, so um, I, um, I think that being in New York and having those conversations with art directors was such a beautiful opportunity and just very unexpected. And um, wasn't that amazing though? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I think that, at least for me, the doing illustration as opposed to locking myself in a studio and trying to make fine art, I think I needed that half step. I, I needed the community. I needed to have a conversation with friends, but also these art directors. It helped to see my work get published and then see the response. You know, it's hard to be objective you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm so impressed with people that just know they want to make art and they can just go into a room and make it. And I didn't have, you know, I was confident, but I, I think that took me a little longer. You were, con- you were conf. I, Nick, I don't, like I said, I only n- know the side that has been confident. Um, and, you know, um, like I said, the entrepreneurial side of you, I've just always, I feel like it's always been on display. Maybe you are not aware of that. I mean, mm, yeah. I mean, when I think of my inner circle of friends and I think of the word entrepreneurial and I have an amazing, um, blessed inner circle of extraordinarily creative friends. Um, but when I think of entrepreneur as well, I mean, I, I go straight to you. Ah, well, well that's. There you go. That's good. Good to hear. Uh, it's awesome. And and so I'm going to tell the story of like how you inspired me uh, of it, it had to do with, you know, it was a little further along where we got, um, you know, I got invited to because of you, you spoke at an art club in Dallas and they invited oh. you out to talk about your work and and I hadn't done a lot of public speaking and I don't think you had either, but you just rocked it. And 
And I mean, I heard about that talk. It was so funny. It was so good. And, and you said, well, the person you really got to talk to is me. And, you know, you pointed them out, got them to invite me out there. So I had all this pressure uh, <laughs> to do a really great thing. And, and, and I got tips from you. It's like, how, how do you talk for an hour and a half? And, you know, you said, well, you want to put a lapel mic on so you can be like David Letterman. You just walk out on the stage, like you own it and everything. And, Long story right. short, I yeah, then, you told me all the all these tips. Okay. So I I came into this event and everyone was still talking about you like, "Oh my god, your friend." I mean, he people were just we're still getting, you know, and then they're like, "Well, we hope yours, you know, it's a tough act to follow, you know." And I was so nervous and uh, you know, and I hadn't done a lot of public speaking and I've shared this story a lot in my programs because it was such a learning thing for me as, as humiliating as it was. I, I basically lost my train of thought. I, I, I got through it, but I, I botched it in the beginning. I was, it was, I was so self-conscious and I was just hoping that everyone would leave at one point because I couldn't remember how to start it. And I just, mm -hmm. I wandered around the stage for a while. Anyway, I got through this thing and, you know, over the years, the humiliation is lessened. I learned a, a great deal, but it was it was so inspiring. You know, it's like this is what friends do. They show you what's possible. And and then I kept at it. And, you know, now I'm I'm not worried so much. I don't think I improved. I just don't I'm not so self-conscious about it. You know, right. Um, you also you yourself, though, you get to practice every day, though, um, speaking with your students now and um one of my one of my favorite quotes, and you, I think you know I love quotes. We both love quotes. Uh, one of my favorite quotes about teaching is "Once a teacher, twice a student." Mm. Uh, and there have been days. I don't know if I should say this out loud, but there are days I think that I have gone home from school thinking, as I'm driving, I think I learned more today than my students did, because mm. um, they teach me so much. Uh, about many things, about many things, not just about art, but about life and and the things that matter. For you guys listening, uh, and we for, kind of forgot this part. Noah's based in Los Angeles. He's he teaches at Art Center College of Design, where we both went. Uh, he's one of the, I mean, I think your top three teachers in that school. Um, but we have a similar approach. It turns out we we've been talking and. To art, to, to art, and it's sort of like teaching it through life and art to life and all of that. So your your classes are part how to, but part philosophy, part right. you know, it, it's it's all of that. It's the approach right. to making your life a work of art, and and I know your students love that. And um, but so you've done. I just want to give the folks listening. You've got you've done children's books. You're a writer. Tell us a little bit about what your chasing and what you've been doing and well i as far as um teaching i've been doing that since the late 90s um first i taught for just a, a second at otis also in los angeles at otis parsons which used to be the sister school of parsons and then um and then i started i was invited to start teaching um at at art center and um it's just been one of the biggest blessings i've ever received and um um, I, what happened was, um, since I had been doing this, um, illustrating for so many years now, there suddenly came a moment in my life, um, and it hit very, very suddenly, um, where all that time that I was spending, um, you know, alone in the studio, um, with a refrigerator and a TV nearby, um, but not being around people. It got to me like me it was. It came out. It came out of nowhere, and um, and then almost at the exact same time, I was invited to teach, and um, and it was something that I think I had always been. You know, I've always loved school. I've always loved going to school. I'm a bit of a nerd in that way, and I love books. I love I love just learning, and I know you do too. Um, you know, I think we're both obsessed with learning. In, in the best possible way. And um, so just when all these feelings were coming up, you know, there's a knock on the door and uh, it's been just one of the best things to ever happen. Um, so what's the like, 
the biggest challenge your students have that you that you have to help them with you know like what is the, what what are you helping them overcome really right i i, I think it's uh the same things that you and i went through early on yeah. um and that was just trusting yourself mm-hmm. that um you know you i remember a conversation you and i had at the beginning of our our careers this is like in the 80s mid 80s and we were talking about um the, you know, wanting to show it to this person. Is it okay? Wanting to show it to this person. Is this okay? Could this be better? You know, could this be stronger? There comes a moment. Um, and by the way, that is what school is partly for. It's to like put your work out there and have a class talk about it, discuss it. How can mm-hmm. it be stronger? How can, how do we pull these ideas out of the students to, um, like, what do you see? What do you see as far as like, how can this be even stronger? Um, how can this have more of an impact and, and, um, and, and impact your viewer in some way? And um, I, I, there comes a time though, where you suddenly are a professional and there's not a classroom anymore. And yeah. And there's and you have and there's no more people to like. Is this okay? Is this all right? <laughs> what do you think? There comes a point where you really are introduced hardcore to trusting yourself. Yeah. And and um, and from there, it really builds upon itself over and over about trusting yourself. I so. I really think in in art making anyway, this piece of intuition where you know, what, what do you think is the right answer? Kind of a question, even if you don't know, I think in art making in the world of creativity, I think we often are correct, you know, those hunches. And I, that was the, the idea for this conversation that if, if I wish that I trusted myself more earlier and I, I tr- I'm trying to do that. You know, if we can trust ourselves, then we can do so many cool things and have such adventures. And, you know, of course, it's the learning and and we do that by being inspired by people and, and all the rest. But it's it's just at the end of the day, it's like just this just feels right. And I, I'm going to just do more of that. You know, Nick, I think you have a lot of people fooled because I think a lot of people think that you do trust yourself very much. I've always thought that you've trusted yourself. It's not that you haven't been without challenges, but you have you you are so humble first off, but also you um have a way about you that you do th- you create your work. It seems from the outside that you're creating your work all- and it's always been this way. I don't remember it ever huh. slide <laughs> in it. Yes, I've had conversations with you a hundred times about things that, you know, each of us have been challenged about. But the, there's something that's built into your DNA that I think you've always had. Um, there's there's still this um, perseverance and um, that and this hunger, this total, yeah. total uh, hunger to know what else is possible. And so you push ahead. Yes, you might you might be questioning every move that you make, but you seem to move ahead and ahead and ahead. Yeah, I think the alternative is what is scary for me. I mean, I, I love, I love the possibilities. I love what's around the corner. I think I love trail running for that because I just, I just can't, I'm so damn curious. Um, but I think that's what artists are, you know, we're, we're curious and, and and that's a pretty good way to be. I think, you know, curious is it's not egotistical. It's not judgmental. You're just curious. You're just kind of (laughs) taking taken over by whatever's in front of you. But uh, yeah. We both definitely have a strong curiosity yeah. about a lot of things. And yeah, and you- I, I, then that's a really, I feel, I feel, don't you feel lucky though to have a curiosity? Yeah, absolutely. So you came to, you came to the visual arts, but you came from a background in English literature correct? And that's, you've been writing since and your children's books. Can you just touch on that a little bit? 
Sure, sure. Well, I I knew from a very early age, like eight years old, that I wanted to write and I wanted to draw. And um, and by the time I was 15 or 16, I knew I was going to go to UCLA for writing. And I knew that I was going to go to art school. Um, I think by the time I was 17, I knew it was going to be Art Center. But um, I, I graduated from UCLA in English literature. I kept, I kept um, waiting for the more creative writing to begin at UCLA. And about two and a half years in, I don't know if I've ever told you this, I discovered I was in the wrong major. Oh, I was- my God. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> I was I was supposed to be I should have been signed up for the creative writing major. I signed up for English literature. Listen, it wasn't bad. I was learning about Tennyson and Shakespeare and Yeats, um, and um, and it was amazing. And I got all that, um, you know, I got to absorb all that. Uh, the creative writing came someplace else much later. So, um, but th- that hunger has always been there to for writing and for art. I um I can't separate the two. Um I um I've spent my career um painting and drawing uh and um and but that writing hunger has never gone away and so I've been exploring that the last several years um and um uh, really sort of teaching myself again how to write and make a coherent sentence um I did doing a couple workshops. I, I did a writing workshop in Italy and I did another one in, uh, uh, up, up, up near you, uh, up. Oh, actually at Esalen for your listeners who don't know Esalen, Esalen is this, well, you've taught there. You should yeah. describe, you've described Esalen. Well, it's, uh, it's set on the central coast of California, uh, just South of a little town called Big Sur. It's this, it's an Indian, uh, land. Esalen was the name of the tribe in that central coast area, I believe. And anyway, it's just this gorgeous property right on the ocean, on cliffs above the ocean. And there is a hot spring, a natural hot spring there. And that's where I began teaching. They host creativity workshops. They've had some of the Buckminster Fullers taught there, Alan Watts, you know, it's sort of the alternative mindfulness movement, spirituality, gestalt work. Uh, so I was always interested in that. And I, you know, I may teach art, there's dance there. So that's where I've always, I've done a lot of workshops there. I, I absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, I've done some other workshops just for myself there. So you did a writing workshop. I, by the way, I should say it's basically utopia, which was my, I, I, I was shocked by, I was shocked by that place. It was just like, I am in heaven now. Um, I mean, it's just the most magical, magical place. Um, yeah, so I did a couple of writing workshops just to, I just wanted to, well, it's what we were just talking about. Like, um, is this okay? Kind of a, kind of a question. And uh, um, I wanted to know that I could, in fact, perhaps occasionally write a coherent sentence. And they said, yeah. Okay, you can write a couple of coherent sentences. So um, I've just been, I've been loving writing forever, but I have been particularly, whether I'm good at it or not, that's a whole nother thing. I get lost in it in a way that is similar, but not the same as when I'm painting. And, um, uh, you know, when you're up until three o'clock in the morning and you have completely lost track that it's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You are lost in it, and it is it is the best thing ever, and um, and I w- I'm reminded now what that what that is like, and that is just that to me is so exciting. What are you working on? I know I know a little bit about it, but you could just give us a little I, idea of what you're working on. I I don't want to say too much about it, but just a little. I've, I've been working on just writing a particular story. Um, that's close to the heart and, um, just putting, um, that, that part of it is all finished, but I, um, I, I, um, I'm doing up some pictures to go with it as well. Some drawings and sort of graphic novel as personal story kind of a thing. So, um, um, also, also just, I have, um, 
ever since I probably have been in the fifth or sixth grade, I ha- I am strongly pulled towards humor. So I, I, I like to just see if I can work a little humor into my storytelling. Um, Cause I think the, the world is hungry for, I think the mm. world is hungry to smile. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you just take on new things and you're just totally iterating, changing, doing this, doing that. And, and there's been so many, uh, I don't know if you just tell us, there's that amazing, amazing story of this transformation that you went through that, uh, you shared at a conference actually that I was mm-hmm. at. And I thought maybe you might want to share that, uh, <laughs> just such a perfect example of, <laughs> of how, you know, how, how we find our way. It's just so fun. Oh my gosh, Nick. Well, it would, it, it'll be a treat to tell you, uh, um, and to share it with your, your listeners. It's, a uh, um, it goes back a little ways. Um, it goes back to when I was about 22. Um, I was working at this really f- fancy schmancy restaurant in, in LA it, there. Everybody was a somebody at each of the tables. It was like Rock Hudson and Doris Day and Paul Newman and Diana Ross. Every, that was every night. Oh. And, uh, and, and all the waiters wanted to be movie stars and and I was a busboy and I just wanted to be a waiter. And I was also the only, <laughs> which is, that's totally true. And, and um, <laughs> it's true. Um, and I was also the only one who was in school because um, they all were, they all were actors. And, um, and also I was 18 years old and I looked like I was six. And um, so that was part of the reason why I wasn't becoming a waiter anytime soon. Anyway, I wrote a, I wrote a children's story about a bus boy who just wanted to be a waiter. Big stretch there. And, um, and it was exactly about how all the waiters wanted to be movie stars. And I did this as a kid's story. So um, we had a, my family had a vacation house up in the mountains and I, I asked my parents if I could take, I said, I'm going to take time off from working at this, this uh, fancy, wonderful, fun, crazy restaurant. Um, uh, the place was called uh, uh, Morton's. It was created by the gentleman who created the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, and he was this uh, amazing, glorious uh, boss. And I learned so much from him. And anyway, so I, I um, my parents said, I, I asked them if I could move up to the house to just work on my illustrations for this book. And they said, sure. So I go up there and I'm, I was obsessed with those rapidiograph pens, the, um, the, the, the ones with the needles that are the thinnest, I think it was called, I think it had six zeros. And, um, and I, I moved up there for, I think two and a half, three months, something like that for the whole summer. And I come back um, with these, just three drawings, just three. Wow. And my, and I, cause all that they were made up of were tiny. They were a scene, but it was very Surat. Um, it was just tiny, tiny little dots and like micro, wow. micro dot. Like clearly I had an anal childhood because like, where was this coming from? I mean, I, I obviously kept my bedroom way too clean as a child. It was coming out in my, in my art. And, um, and I showed them to my father. Now my father, my father was a doctor, but, um, he was also a painter and a sculptor. And, um, and so he, he, he under my dad understood art and he also understood his son. And, um, and he, he, he looked, he, he understood his son more than his son understood himself. Pardon myself for talking about myself in third person. Um, anyway, so my dad simply looks at the drawings and he says, he says, do you know, do you know the phrase kiss, K-I-S-S? And I s- said, no. And he, you know, it's supposed to be keep it simple, stupid. Um, but he said, keep it simple, son. And he said, how are you going to make a living as an artist if all, you you just come back with three images and um, and if you're going to be taking on illustration work and turning it out and get being amongst many jobs all at once, um, how are you going to do that if you're working so minutely? And um, um, so 
I took this and I really digested uh, my dad's words. I start, I graduate UCLA. I start, um, I start uh, art center and I'm working on an independent project when I was 22. And it was, it was a book on dating, completely tongue in cheek. I didn't know anything about dating. And um, again, it was supposed to be completely funny. And that was the intention. And I, this is how long ago it was. I was airbrushing the illustrations for this book. Uh-huh. And um, for for those who do not know about airbrushing, it's the worst invention ever created and put on the planet. And uh, I mean, you're literally putting paint, paint that's liquid in a cup and you're mapping out where you're going to shoot it out of this little like silver gun and it has to land just in the perfect place on your illustration board and then it, the paint goes flying through the air and you're inhaling it so your lungs are like pink and orange and brown mm-hmm. anyway i could not stand it and so one day i stay after class and i and i and i tell one of my favorite teachers uh who's no longer uh around um i i said to her you know i I don't like airbrushing. And she said, um, have you ever tried um, working on acetate? You know, like an animation cell. Now, you, I have to say that this is completely, totally before everyone was on the computer. This is way before Photoshop. This is 1984, 85. And uh, there was no Photoshop. There was no Illustrator. There was no Procreate on the iPad. No, nothing. No computer. And so I said, no, that one little sentence that that teacher said, yeah. have, have I ever tried painting on acetate, was how I ended up working for the next 15 years. And um, just from that one little sentence that, that this wonderful, amazing teacher had said to me. And so I graduate from, uh, from Art Center and I, um, and I moved to New York City and I... Uh, you and I both, uh, we got work immediately. Yes, we were doing interviews in the morning, but the work for both of us, it came in also immediately. We we worked our butts off. We worked our butts off going, walking up and down Fifth Avenue and and all, all Madison Avenue and showing our books and coming back to our studios, painting and drawing until two o'clock in the morning and doing it all over again, five times a week. Um, and... Um, Again, I did it for 15 years and, and all of a sudden I just, I just slammed into an enormous creative wall and it it came out of nowhere. And I mean, it came out of somewhere, but it kind of came out of nowhere for me. And I suddenly did not want to work that way any longer. Um, it was so, the work was so tight and it was so clean and there was no room to mess up your work. There was complete mobility to, to mess up in your paintings. Mine with the acetate, it was very, it had ink on one side and paint on the other. And that ink was permanent. And if you wanted it away, you had to scrape at it. Anyway, I was having a crisis there's a, there's a, I think it's a Japanese word and I might have this completely wrong, but the idea of it, I love, I believe it's called Ouija. Uh, a Ouija is um, uh, having out of a crisis comes an opportunity. And um, so as I slammed into this um, enormous, uh, enormous creative wall, I didn't know it, but suddenly I was about to find some kind of opportunity. And uh, for the first thing that happened was that now, now we jump ahead to like right at the moment that everyone is suddenly on the computer creating artwork. Mm. And because I worked so tightly, art directors were all my old clients and new clients were calling me up and, and looking at this work and asking, what program is this? Cause it looked like computer art. Oh That's how God. great it was. And I'm like, I'm like trying to explain to them, it's, it's not a computer. I did it by hand. I just had a really anal childhood. And so I'm <laughs> oh, it was so upsetting. Anyway, the next thing that happened, uh, I'm back in LA 
And I get this completely random invitation to go study with nine Tibetan monks in the middle of the desert. You know, just your average Tuesday. And um, I go to the desert and I'm greeted by these nine monks, including the, the lead monk was the, they told us was the right hand man to the Dalai Lama. We were the same age. Um, and uh, they could not have been more funny and hysterical and playful and really naughty and on, on, at one moment. And then during profoundly deep moments, um, they would, there were about 17 students and me being there, I can't emphasize enough how random it was that I was there. When we would go on these walks in like 110 degree heat in the middle of the desert, they would find these enormous rocks to sit in front of and sit, um, uh, sit down in front of these rocks that sort of shadowed us. And they would talk to us about life. And, and what happened was they, they not only reminded me about simplicity and joy and laughter, but while I was having this creative crisis, they were also talking about some pretty important things that I was dealing with. And that was authenticity versus inauthenticity. And then they were also raising the question of between flow versus stagnation. Mm. And in my work, I was feeling completely inauthentic. It wasn't what I want. I didn't identify with that drawing style anymore. I did not, I was feel, feeling completely stagnant in my work. Uh, so there was no flow. <laughs> it's uh, so wild how, how it's all of a sudden, you know, it's like, I, I talk about it like all of a sudden you just outgrow a coat, you know, it's like, I can't wear this anymore. And you know, exactly, exactly. And they, they talked about if the human body was, is mostly water, like what, 70% or something, you would think our most natural state was to flow, except of course, when it doesn't. And, um, and all I had was all my old work back in my studio that was sort of blocking me like a yeah. dam and blocking my big damn flow. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that. I was, my time with the, those monks, it was a, it was a, it was a staggering, I can't emphasize enough. It was a staggering experience that brought my life to a literal standstill. And I remember going back, back there six months later, and I ran into somebody who experienced it as well with the monks. And they said the same thing. Their life was brought to a complete stop um, because of what they talked about. The next thing that happened, and I have to say. But when what I, happened? What did they, what did the monks say to you? Oh, you want Chill to out, relax. Yeah. Like where they just, they felt your, they just felt you weren't at home in yourself probably is. More. Well, it came so much to a specific di diagnosis on each person. They were talking about broad, broad ideas mm -hmm. that however you digested it, I just knew what was going on with me at the time and how it was just, it shook up my world. It was, it was also a, a mirroring process of them simply saying exactly what I had was feeling, but with like 35,000 exclamation marks all around it. Um, so when I got back from my visit with the monks, when I arrived home on my doorstep was, and this goes to show how long ago it was, there was an eight track videotape and it was, um, it was an homage to a teacher that you and I both had who had died rather shockingly and suddenly. And he was also my favorite teacher. And I, he was in his talking of Dwight Harmon, amazing artist, human being, incredible. By far my favorite teacher. Um, I, had a, I had a couple of favorite teachers, but there was, he took it someplace else. He was humble. 
hysterically funny. He was kind. He was unassuming. And he was a gift uh, to, to hundreds and hundreds and, hun well, I think thousands of people. I, and I, this is just my own personal opinion, but he probably had a, one, of, one of the biggest impacts on illustration than, I, I don't know, I can't think of anyone else who had such an impact. What was, so there was a, this, this videotape and I'm watching it with tears rolling down my eyes, just coming back from the monks. And um, and being reminded left and right of all the things that Dwight had taught us, and at its core was to not be afraid of making things, to to also make a mess, and um, that is like one of the biggest things. He he could get you to make a mess, and I just want if I can just share, he. <laughs> There was one particular time, and I'm sure you probably you might guess what I want to mention. There was one time also he is standing in front of a class. There's a videotape of this. He's standing in front of the classroom. There's like 20 people in the classroom. And he says to the students, how much money will you give me if I eat this acrylic paint? Now, I want to be clear. Don't eat acrylic paint. So he's standing, <laughs> he's standing up there. And people are like, ha, 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 very funny, ha, ha, ha. And then all of a sudden on, on videotape, I think, you start to see some of the students putting down $1 bills. And Dwight is looking at it like, and he's going about his business and he's doing demos at the front of the, at the front of the room. And his demos were hysterical. And he was like, he'd be painting something and then he'd just like sl literally just throw paint on it and just okay. smear it and just take a razor blade and go right through. I mean, he was so good like that. Anyway, you start to see all these $1 bills going on the table and, uh, and he, He's like, yeah, that, that's not enough money. And then on that video, there's a hand. You don't see the person, but there's a hand that slips through with a $20 bill. And Dwight looks at that 20 and he's like, Where, where'd that come from? And, uh, and then he stands up, he picks up the 20 and he starts and he picks up all the ones. He counts them out. And then he's like, okay. He sticks them in his pocket. He takes a tube of black acrylic paint and he squirts it in his mouth. <laughs> I'm not talking a little. He squirts this huge amount of acrylic paint uh. into his mouth. And, and he sticks out his tongue. The class is in hysterics. The class is going, and it's all caught on camera. The class is going completely bonkers, just nuts. And, and Dwight is laughing. And his, his mouth, everything is just, it's just covered in paint. And you see him walk to the back sink in in room one hundred, and and he and that's sort of where it ends, like there. My the way that I um, internalized that over the years was just one of the many ways that he got to say, "Don't be afraid of pain." You know, it's all mm -hmm. here just to help you. He he went to some massive extremes. Yeah. But the bigger picture was to not be afraid. Just one other quick story of what he did, which I, I hold to my heart, is that he knew, based on my, my entering portfolio into art school, that I was still working with that, that pen and ink rapidiograph. <laughs> and that's all I, in, that's my, that was my entire portfolio were these pen and ink drawings. Um, and, um, and somehow I still got in. And he knew he sensed that I was absolutely terrified of color, which maybe some of your students can identify with as well. And so, so Dwight had everybody build a canvas that, that was four feet by five feet. And, um, and I made the most beautiful canvas and it was, it was, it was beautiful. I couldn't believe I was able to make such, it was perfection. Perf perfection, however, was the problem. As Dwight famously said to me, perfection and I were never friends. Uh. 
And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. I wish I could have some of that, uh, is what I was thinking. Anyway, so I'm, I am fully, fully outwardly hesitant to start this project. And he sees it and he, and he says, come here, come here, bring, bring your canvas. And these were in those huge downstairs studios. And uh, he, he lays my canvas on the ground and he goes and he gets this giant pail of light blue paint and he takes his hands and he dips them all the way into the pail. Oh my God. And he starts finger painting all over my canvas, my supposedly perfect canvas. And he's finger painting and he's like, and I'm like, this guy is a madman. And, and then he says, Hey, Noah, come here. He goes, it, it's your turn. And I'm like, all this money is being paid to go to this art school to finger paint. And he goes, come on, come on, put your hands in the paint. So he slides the pail of light blue paint. And we're talking like, it was, it was like, it was not that big. And so he goes, yeah, go on, do it, do it. And so I put my hands all the way into the pail. And I take them out and, and he goes, go on, go on. And, and I start, I start to do it. And uh, Dwight looks at me and he goes, feels pretty good, doesn't it? And I'm, and I'm yeah. looking at him and I'm like, you crazy, crazy man. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, this feels really good. And, uh, and again, it was just another thing that he could do that allowed me to give myself permission to make a mess. The next thing that happened, again, around this same time period, and as you might tell, I, I was brought up in a house where books were deeply loved, and I have run out of space for all my books. But at that time, four books fell into my lap. Can I share those books with you? Yes, please. And we'll have these, you guys. You don't have to take notes. We'll have them in the show links, as well as images of uh, links for, for Noah's work and everything. So, Fantastic. Now, listen, I have a feeling a lot of your, your, your listeners and your students know some of these books for sure. But one of them, one of them is The Art Spirit. And The Art Spirit by, a, how do you say his last name? Is it Robert Henri? I've, I've heard it, Robert Henry, uh, Henri. Uh, Henri, but I... Uh, That's how yeah. I've always said it. And as you can see, I, I have a lot of notes in there. So even though this book is written way over 100 years ago, it feels like it was written last Tuesday. And here's the deal on it and why I love The Art Spirit. The Art Spirit is written by a painter, but he's also he was also a teacher. And one of my favorite things that I got from the book was uh, this, this message to, to students. And that was, don't just look at the world of art, but look at the world so that when you are amongst your friends, don't, don't just talk about art, but talk about the world so that when you get back to your work, you can bring the world back to your art. And that book is just filled with things like that. But the next book that really changed me was, and I think a lot of you might have this book, was Wabi Sabi uh, for artists, designers, poets, and uh, philosophers. Now, the idea of Wabi Sabi has been around for centuries, but uh, uh, this particular edition sort of made a massive impact when it came out, when it first came out. It is a thin book with thick information, but for a kid who kept his bedroom way too clean as a seven-year-old, it was the idea of imperfection was a mind-blowing idea. And that's in an essence of what Wabi Sabi, as you know, is. It's about beautiful imperfection. That was life-changing, that there was such a thing as beautiful imperfection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that there were visuals showing inside the book these uh, beautiful imperfections. Oh, that's what that is. Oh, why am I being, you know, sucked into that and drawn to that so yeah. much? Why yeah. is that affecting me so much? 
The next book that fell into my lap was uh, the Keith Herring Journals. The Keith Herring Journals, um, I have a lot of books on on Keith Herring, and I I actually got to talk with him a couple of times. But um, this book in particular, I cannot recommend enough. And here's the reason why. The first half of the book is about just him growing up um, and um, and his own his own dreams and hopes of you know being an artist. The second half of the book is clearly about him becoming this massive rock star painter artist. Yeah, but it's not just it's not just that. It is also that he makes lists through this book of things that um, I began to look at. Like I made I made so many notes through this book. But there, I found out about so many other artists through this book, and he was so highly passionate. Um, when I when I first met him in New York, Nick, I don't know if I ever told you the story. I walked into the Tony Shafrazi Gallery. That's where he showed, um, but also Jean Michel Basquiat also showed at that gallery. This is in you know when you and I were living in Soho, you could literally walk out yeah. your door, and there was. Keith Haring, there was Basquiat, there was Julian Schnabel, um, there was Warhol, there were, everybody was there. And um, anyway, so I, as I mentioned earlier, I would do, every time that I would come from uptown from interviews, I would go into the galleries at least two every day just to see what's up. And one day I walked into Shafrazi's gallery, and there was Keith Haring hanging his own show. I didn't know at the time that Keith actually worked for for Tony Shafrazi um, as his as one of his many jobs there as somebody who installed all the art. Oh and God. I and I I looked up on the wall and the the show I still remember even though this is like 1987. Um, I I look up on the wall and I'm and I said something really naive like that is my favorite piece of all. And he said, that's mine too. That's my favorite. And he said, I wish I could keep that piece, but I could use the 40,000 is what he said. Wow. And, uh, and I don't know if he was kidding or not about the 40 grand, but what I walked away remembering is I wanted to be making art that would be hard to give up to. Mm. And that really resonated mm. with when he said that, I was like, oh, that, that sounds really good. To make art, you are going to give it away, but you don't want to give it away. That mm. sensation. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The last book that I want to share um, uh, is um, a book, I think, that has a world record, a, a Guinness Book of World Record. I think. I remember it at least one time. And, and it is uh, Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Wilka. Um, the book is also over a hundred years old. Again, thin book, massively thick information. What is it? Uh, and what is the world record that it holds? Um, at the time, um, and I think still, it is the most published book of letters between two people. So who are the two people? One was a 19 year old young man who was also a poet who was writing to Wilka for, I hope I'm saying his name right after all these years. Um, and uh, he was writing to Wilke, who at the time, I believe, was a 55-year-old uh, German poet. Um, and he was at, the 19-year-old young man was asking Wilke for advice. Can I read to you a passage that I have absolutely loved? Sure, yes. It's a short little passage, but it speaks to the bigger picture, Nick, of, of trusting yourself. Um and in this little passage that I want to read, Nick, this is 55-year-old Wilka writing a letter back to this 19-year-old young man who's asking for advice. This is about, this is a conversation between two writers, but it's not. This is for anybody that makes anything. Yeah. You ask whether your verses are good. You ask me. You have asked others before. You send them to magazines. You compare them with other poems, and you are disturbed when certain editors reject your efforts. Now, since you've allowed me to advise you, 
I beg you to give up all that. You are looking outward and that above all, you should not do now. Nobody can counsel you and help you, nobody. There is only one single way, go into yourself, search for the reason that bids you to write. Find out whether it's spreading out its roots in the deepest places of your heart. Acknowledge to yourself whether you would have to die if it were denied you to write. This, above all else, ask yourself in the stillest hour of your night, must I write? Delve into yourself for a deep answer. And if this should be met with an affirmative, if you meet this earnest question with a strong and simple, I must, then build your life according to this necessity. Your life, even into its most indifferent and slightest hour, must be a sign of this urge and a testimony to it. And then he ends that passage with a great bit of advice and it simply says, then draw near to nature. Mm. So that just kind wow. of shattered, that just kind of shattered me, and uh, that whole book did. So you have that's a book you have to read slowly to kind of digest. It's incredible! It. It's incredible! It's so powerful, so beautiful. But listen, here's what I want to do. I we're just getting going here, and I'm gonna do something which I've never done before. We're we're at an hour, and. I want to invite our listeners to, uh, you know, at the end of this, uh, which we're approaching, I'm going to do a follow-up with Noah because there's a whole bunch of stuff that I need, we got to share and we need a little bit more time. So we're going to, we're going to end here and, and do this as a two-parter. Would you be okay with that? Of course. Oh, awesome. you. Yeah, because we're we're just getting going. But listen, folks, uh, if you go to the Art to Life uh, podcast or arttolife.com and click on podcasts, uh, either one of those, you can uh, not only uh, uh, record a question for Noah, uh, if you go to the little yellow tab on that episode, uh, under the on the episode, we just, you know, this this episode, you can record a question and this will be so great because we can have Noah follow up um, when we come back and answer some of those because there's so much stuff being shared here. I would love that, Nick. I, you know, I, I, when I had a chance earlier to, to speak with your, your current students, um, I, I mentioned my, um, I'm, uh, and so I mentioned, I mentioned Instagram and uh, at Noah Woods um, underscore underscore. I heard from a few hundred of your students, which was amazing. And they had questions and different things and they could not. Yes. Have been. So by all means, they, they can also reach out to me uh, on Instagram at Noah Woods underscore underscore. And all those links uh, are in the show notes of this episode at uh, under podcasts at art life.com. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to have this. We're going to do this as a two parter and, uh, <clears throat> this we've actually now we're videoing uh, all these podcasts. And so you can go to the art to life YouTube channel and watch there. Uh, it's kind of cool to see, uh, to have, to have some visuals with, uh, with this audio. Noah, thanks so much for being here and uh, stay tuned everyone for part two. Thanks, Nick. It's been a treat.